Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And we're delighted to have you with us today. Our event on tackling the digital divide, partnering for access, skills, and empowering girls. I am Shay Gopal. I'm the permanent representative of IOE to the UN. IOE is an organization that represents 50 million companies throughout the world in over 145 different countries. We represent the views of business, both to the ILO, we discuss with OECD, with the G20, and we are particularly interested in policy debates around industrial relations, skills, the G20, various forums, and numerous policy debates on social protection, informality, diversity, and of course, skills. We're delighted to have this session during the UN DESA Science and Technology Forum. We, the private sector, businesses, large and small, international organizations are committed to share our technology, know-how, innovation to achieve the SDGs. Today, our focus is on LDCs, Digital Divide, Girls, Women, and Skills. But first, let me um, highlight a few housekeeping rules. Today, we are using two platforms. We are using the UN DESA WUVA site, which many of you have now logged on to, and also Zoom. You can raise questions on both platforms. This session is being recorded and we will have a short report and the recording up on UN uh, DESA's site shortly. So now let's go and start our debate. Globally, people throughout the world are connected to the internet. However, there are 2.9 million people who are not connected to the internet, of which many of them are women. This is a serious issue for all of us there is a digital divide. Now, today we're going to do a deep dive into connectivity, but also the lack of skills by particularly women. We can appreciate that in LDCs in particular, they're in the digital divide. Only 19% of women have access to the internet. This is absolutely critical that we really take um, action in this area. There's also a divide for the generations. Younger people are more connected in LDCs. And so there is an opportunity here that we address the digital divide. But as we said, throughout the world there's a digital divide, but our focus is really on least developed countries. And IOE has been very happy to partner with Microsoft on the business forum, which will take place at the LDC event in Qatar next year. And we really want to take action and we are committed to making things move. So before um, I um, carry on and, and passionately say that we need to take action, I would like to introduce Roberto Suarez uh, Santos, who is the Secretary General of IOE, who will be having a little fireside chat with our uh, uh, invitee, Nicholas Goldstein, the co-founder of Talentium. So I give the floor to you, Roberto. Thank you, Shay. I will go briefly in the introduction. I mean, you have also referred to the IOE, what we do. Let me just highlight how engaged we want to be to tackle the digital divide. And this year I know that one of the reporting exercises, the global reporting exercise will be precisely on educational SDGs. You refer to access to internet, access to infrastructure, that also digital literacy or digital illiteracy will, mean, will make, is making the difference. I mean, if you see the number of startups in Latin America, how incredibly are they helping also to overcome many of the challenges that we can see in uh, developing economies. You will realize how important it is that, especially for LDCs, the infrastructure is there, the skills are there. And also you focus on those who are really more needed of these skills. And that's why already some years ago, 
we decided that in one of these forums in which have a leading road bringing business, which is the GMFT, the Global Forum for Migration Development, we wanted to bring fresh air. We wanted to bring those who can really attract, you know, the attention of policymakers at national and international level in mobility issues, in skills issues. And we decided to, to, uh, to set up a contest with young people, with young talent people, providing ideas, solutions also to bring this skills agenda much farther uh, in the international policy scene. And that's why we brought, uh, uh, well, this contest uh, in the DMFD in Quito already, it was my last meeting, by the way, and my, my last face-to-face -face meeting before the pandemic started, it was in January and February. And the winner of this contest was precisely Nicolas, who is now with us. He is a co-founder of, of a very interesting startup, which is called talentum.com. And he was the finalist of the first edition, and we are now organizing the third of um, the third edition this year. Nicola Golden is the co-founder of the web pan African platform talentum.com. He's very much involved in the tech ecosystem startup in Africa, which is amazing. I mean, if you see the youth component that this region has and also how vibrant they can be, they have the means. Uh, he's also on board of the French Tech in Mauritius, uh, where he's now. And thank you also for joining us so late. It's eight o'clock there, if I'm not wrong. And he's very, currently dedicated to the growth of uh, this company, which he founded with uh, John Benatul, in order to give the chance to high potential talents in Africa to work remotely. And you, you, you see how pertinent it was three years ago for international company. Um, so, I have four questions for you, and I will go one by one in that in this side, far, far side chat. How do you see the challenge and needs of employers? They are evolving. Uh, and, and we have been trying to predict that, but I don't think that we have been very successful. Uh, how do you see what an employer right now needs now in terms of talent, uh, Nicolas? And thank you again for your needs. Thank you, Roberto. And uh, yes, of course, uh, the migration challenge you organized in 2019 was great. Uh, I remember we were 10 startups from all over the world to came and uh, to bring a uh, fresh air to the to then to meet uh, organization and institutional people was uh, also a, a great opportunity for us uh, startup. So uh, to talk about the challenges about employers they have currently, of course, the world has changed through the pandemic and they have to adapt. And uh, to um, adapt the shortage of talent they are going to face, for me, they need to uh, think about three things. First is attracting talent. Now you need to attract pe 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 talent because if you want to have the great talent, you need to attract them. Then you have to retain the talent because now, as you can see in US, you have a big resignation. People are leaving. They want to work remotely. They want to work uh, in a social company and so on. So you have to retain them. And then you have to know how to use technology because now a company who are not using technology, uh, they are not going to, uh, to keep their growth. So I think the two main, the three main uh, skills employer need to improve are attracting people, retaining people, and how, know how to use very well the technology. So retaining it will be very, very easy. It's uh, mainly uh, give them a good salary. And talking about Atalanta, when we are talking to our people, so what we do is we are helping African talents to work remotely while they are remaining in their country. And when we talk to our company, which are outside Africa, uh, what we are saying is if you want to attract also good talent, you need to pay them well. That's why we are also compliant with SDG number eight, which has you have to give a decent salary, uh, whatever the country they are. Perhaps they are, you are going to pay them well, less than in Europe and US, but you have to pay them better than what they have in their local market if you want to have the good talent. So this is what we say every day to our employers, which are our partner. And then attracting. So how to attract people? Now you have to think about... Uh, talking about CSR, what does the impact of your company? Uh, what benefit are you giving? Are you giving 100% remote hybrid work or do you want them all to be back at home? 
So that's uh, also what employers should think. And technology, you have to uh, use all the technology which is possible. And uh, early adopters, companies, employers will be the people who will benefit from it. Which, which is leading me to the second question. At the end of the day, well, you're, you're referring to the global talent competition, which is very exciting and it's fascinating. And you're referring also to skilled talent people in Africa, even in, in all kinds of countries, in LDC countries, also providing services to developed economies. And, and, and we see that on a daily basis growing enormously. But at the end of the day, you need the skills, isn't it? I mean, and also you need the infrastructure. What kind of skills do you, you are requiring? I mean, you see it as, as evolving. I mean, uh, it's, it's not the same as five years ago. It's not the same as 10 years ago. And the cycle of skills update is also exchanging. Yeah, sure. I will say that, you know, one skills which you need to have if you work remotely or not, it's you need to have empathy. It's it will be a silly what I said, but you know, someone who has got empathy, co who communicate well with empathy, will be the the game changer of the next uh, ten years. Why? Because technology is taking uh, a lot of things. So, but empathy, a human being will always have it. So, first of all, the first thing that uh, we are pushing our talents from our community to have is to get empathy to have the smile, even if we don't see your face. So this is what we say to, to our people in Africa. If you want to be better than others, you need to bring empathy. You need to bring some uh, some heat when you- Social talk. skills, we call it. Exactly. Uh, it, it used to be called soft skills, badly called soft skills. And we are we are pushing this agenda of social skills. It's exactly, soft skills is number one. Then of course, solve a problem because now you need to be, uh, uh, critical thinking, you need to be solve a problem. That will be the second um, uh, skills you need. And then, of course, digital literacy. Now, it's not possible to be uh, outside uh, uh, innovation and technology. So, for example, what we do here at Talenteum, for example, we have people which we are hiring from call centers. And we said, you know, if you are not improving yourself, technology will take your job. So you have to think of tomorrow job. And tomorrow job, you need to bring um, empathy. You need to train yourself to something which technology can't take your job. So this is what we say in Africa that uh, uh, a lot of people used to outsource uh, low uh, value job. Now we try to put and think about what will be the job of tomorrow and try to train these people. And when you have the, the good um, base, you can... Uh, uh, put some bootcam and uh, I can give you some example, but you can have some uh, uh, some uh, three months, four months uh, uh, short employability, but bootcamp to help this population in needs. And it it is good also for men and women in order to respect to respect the SDG four and five about uh, gender equality. But also, and that's the third question. I mean, we are talking about talent, talent people, okay? And that's your work. At the end of the day. Uh, we are also looking at vulnerable people, people that perhaps are in a much more... Can you give an example of your company, Talentum, uh, also helping to... I mean, this is a kind of sentence that we use in the UN language, is no, leaving no one behind. I mean, how, how you can really address this, this, this problem, not just to have the digital divide, leaving people outside in a very vulnerable situation? Yes. Well, to one example, for example, I had someone who called me from Cameroon, he said, Nicholas, I am an accountant, but I'm not having a good living. I'm paid, I'm an accountant, I have a good degree. Uh, I was major in my company in mathematics, but I'm paid, I, I think it was like uh, $400, something like that per month for being uh, an accountant. I said, look, if you are looking from outside, you need to improve yourself and perhaps change what you are doing. From an accountant, you think you should perhaps become a financial analyst or business analyst, but for that, you need to train yourself. And you have some free academy and you have some lot of tutorial on YouTube and so on. And I'm sure that uh, follow what few steps to become a business analyst or a financial analyst. And this is what he did. And after three or four months, we have uh, find him a job to be a financial analyst in a startup based in Israel, remotely from Cameroon. And this guy is still working with this company and he had the 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 the, the, the volonté. We said that the, he, he the will, really the willingness. <laughs> the willingness to succeed. 
and they have uh, work day and night to learn how to be a financial analyst and understand the technology because now the startup what they want it's to how to use the technology and the software so he has used that and from an accountant he became a junior financial analyst and he's earning one thousand dollars from six months back he was earning four thousand so it's possible oh. and this is one of our success stories and we have many of them that's yeah, one I mean, it's Oh, sorry, sorry, continue, please. Mm. And then the issue we can have in Africa, it's again energy. We, are, we have sometimes in these few countries, some electricity, which bad electricity, internet is costing two times what it's costing in Europe. So I think we need, for Africa to what I've seen, we, we need to invest in fact in three things in Africa, it's education, entrepreneurship and energy. This is what we call the three E. And uh, this is what uh, we try to, uh, to see if it's possible to work remotely with these people. And we, we put some framework to it. And this is why employers are coming to us because we are the third party to help employer to work with these kind of uh, people everywhere in Africa. Thank you. Uh, there is a final question because you refer to the energy prices and uh, then what kind of support you need from governments and from international organizations? Oh, it's a very broad question. Okay, I understand. But if we have to give priority right now, bearing in mind also SDG 8 and all, all the, the needs for an educational system, how we can help better? What, what, what need we need to do better? Well, we are not, uh, we are in the business side, but of course, closing, uh, working closely with international organizations. So can you tell us from your perspective where we need as policy makers, one of the policy makers at the international level, but also local level need to do better? Yeah. For example, uh... I signed a few days ago um, a partnership with Foundation Tunisia, which is backed by the government of Tunisia, about upskilling people. But uh, what I saw, they, uh, they have upskilled people from uh, in few technologies, but they have not, not talked directly to corporate and to people like us. So they have upskilling people and uh, they have upskilled people, but these people are not ready to be employed. So it's good to have some initiative from governments, but sometimes it's good to have a partnership between governments, employers, and startup as well, because we are giving, we are we can give advice about governments in which field you need to improve uh, upskilling training people, and uh, that's why now we are signing with them because we said that look, we know what who what are the jobs of employers are taking and where you can train them in uh, six months because it was not possible they were in training people in java technology but you can't create engineers in java but you can create other people with other background in a short term so sometimes it's good to upskill but you need to see the reality and sometimes they need to talk directly to employers to do some partnership between uh, public and, uh, and uh, non-public yeah, so we have to be smarter in terms of the training that we provide okay exactly. That's and in order to do that, you need to better liaise with those who are going to be the future uh, employers or startups, etc. Which is not exactly happening at all in, in many countries. Yeah, yeah we need to be smarter all together, you know. Uh, and uh, we need to try to uh, to find the thing because we are focusing into Africa, and as you know, uh, the demography is will double in. Uh, the next 10, 20 years, and we need to find things how to bring more uh, jobs, we need to train more people, and we need these people to remain in their continent in order to create this middle class Africa needs. And uh, it will help people not to migrate, we need to create uh, Africa a great continent and we need to uh, do not think about dreaming about going to US or Europe, we have to re keep African people in their continent and they want to see this. Like talking to African people and talents every day, they will love to stay in their in their country and to build Africa. Exactly, and we need to bring the opportunities there, not the other way. Thank you so much, Nicolas. I think I have been, uh, we have been diligent with our time consumption, uh, Nicolas. Right. Right? So, Shane, now to you to continue the conversation. Thank you so much for listening to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. No, uh, can we just keep you for one minute, Nicolas? Sure. Um, there's a question, particularly, I think, because of young people. Um, can you tell us, in your experience, because you're working in this area and you're particularly um, in um, Africa, 
what are the three top jobs that you're seeing that are in most in demand right now? And what are obviously you mentioned a lot about the skills, but what are the particular skills that you would say if young people were to focus on something in order to be uh, more employable? Of course, very good question, Cher. So of course, number one will be everything related to technology. So first we have all the engineers which are developing and you have all kinds of technology first, but if you are not an engineer, if you can't develop, uh, perhaps you have to see first, what is your background? If you have a financial background, you should perhaps think about what are the technology where I can improve myself. For example, I was talking about this accountant. He was a simple accountant in a shop and he became a financial analyst through technology. So that's what you have to do. Then marketing, if you want to do in marketing, you have to think about uh, who are the technology close to my related expertise. For example, I, help, I have helped people to uh, double his salary, he's from Mauritius, and uh, I just uh, find um, an academy from US and he just trained himself to be better in, in his field in marketing and so on and so on. So first, in which field are you already good and you have some good uh, uh, knowledge and then improve yourself by bringing technology. You are a salesman, you need to know how to use Salesforce or a CRM and so on. So because if you're only a salesman without technology, it's not enough. Now you need to be a salesman plus a technology. So this is my advice. Okay, thank you. Um, and so we take back uh, empathy, empathy, and the three E's. I really like that um, in the way, in way of uh, a summary and, and moving forward. So now we're delighted to take you on a little voyage. We are going to go very quickly to Barbados, India, South Africa, and Argentina. And we're going to hear from IOE employer federations. These are business associations at the country level, and they represent large and small companies in their country. They are negotiating with the governments. They are working on legislation, regulation, policy frameworks in order to address various items, but including the digital divide and the skills deficit. So now we take you on our journey and we're going to play a short video for you. Well, we've spoken a lot about um, the digital transformation and the digitization of industry and that that particular aspect is very, very important, um, especially because a lot of the transformations within industries becoming automated from a digital standpoint. And also there is um, the gig economy where so many um, people are working remotely now or have the opportunity to, to do that. And so the skills need to be developed where um, individuals and companies are able to utilize virtual offices. Um, however, um, remote work has to, has to take place. EBMOs will play the largest, or should rather, play the largest role because they understand the common skills that are coming in and they understand where organizations and employers are going ahead and they also understand the aspirations of the youth. Coming from India we find that digital platforms are going to be the big way to go. Connecting people through digitally and offering skills which are uh, through a digital and sometimes an offline model. If we're talking our future of work, if we're seeing where economies are going, uh, how businesses are developing. There's absolutely no doubt that, that we technologically we're advancing with great strides. And so technical skills, uh, skills to actually become more customer oriented, skills to identify to and respond to a diverse range of customers that, that are, are demanding different platform through which to be serviced. Customers that, that are demanding services almost instantaneously, customers that are mobile. You need to develop the sort of skills that will firstly understand that, response to that, and, and 
I think, understand the interconnections between business and society and, and what's impacting on society. In a transition uh, time, uh, adaptability, the capacity of learning, both uh, the workers and the organizations and, and companies need to be very adaptive and uh, open to learn new dynamics, new technologies, to innovate. Uh, but this is basically to understand what, uh, what, the, what the world, what the markets and uh, what the people are, are demanding. So thank you for that. So we can see that throughout the world, there is a huge demand for employers, international organizations, um, federations to work together on this. Um, before I introduce um, the panel, the distinguished panel, I forgot to mention in the beginning, which is an error on my part, that we are organizing this event with ILO and Microsoft. They are the co-sponsors of this event, and we are delighted to have them today with us, but also as a partner as we work closely with them. So now I have the, the delight of having our uh, interactive panel with, uh, I would first introduce our panelists um, and they can put on their cameras now. Srivinivas Reddy, who is the Chief Skills and Employability Branch at the ILO. Jennifer Brooks, who is the Director of Global Partnerships at Microsoft. And Hasna Barak Duad from the Employers Federation of Djibouti, who is also a Senior Legal Advisor at Great consulting and trading. Um, so I am delighted to have you here today, but it's not about um, one particular group, but what we want to hear is in tackling this, we know we all have to work together. So we have an international organization, we have an employer and we have an employer's federation. So I think we'll just dive into some of the questions that we thought could be interesting for our audience um, to hear your perspective. So Srinivas, first for you, if I could ask you, you and I have been working together since my role in the Global Apprenticeship Network and I did my study for the ILO. We're talking 10, 13 years ago. It's been many years we've been talking about uh, the skills mismatch, the lack of talent, the need for more girls in STEM education, and in general, just better training programs. Why are we not moving faster in training in this education? And given all the re research that you do in so many different countries, what are some of the success stories where you see it actually moving quicker than in other areas or other countries? Thank you very much, Shia. Thank you for uh, having me. Uh, thanks for the uh, great question. Um, the issue of skills mismatch is so urgent. And, and as you rightly pointed out, why are we not moving faster? Uh, it's a very, very important question. Uh, the challenge of uh, skills mismatch has actually multiple layers. It is in fact, not only about skills, it is about mismatch between skills, jobs, and people's aspirations. People may develop skills but it is important to create adequate number of decent jobs. Similarly, even when skills are developed and jobs are created, those jobs may not match the people's aspirations. So we need to address this from a holistic perspective of job creation and investing in people with their active participation. Um, the world of work is obviously continuously changing and evolving. So how do we address this? Our challenge is to really anticipate the skills for existing and as well as the new economies, like for example, the green and digital and care economies and other economies of priority for any country. And this requires policy coherence and partnerships, particularly the critical importance of education, skills, employment and economic and environmental policies, addressing the skills issues in a coordinated manner. And also equally important is the importance of role and uh, the whole of government approach with employers and workers organizations and educational institutions working together through a process of social dialogue to develop the right set of skills that match the aspirations of people and the needs of the labor market. She, as you said, although our task is very challenging, but successful programs do exist. A case in point, 
I would like to mention is the Women in STEM program in the Philippines, which focuses on women and girls through a close collaboration between private sector companies and the state Tibet authority, that is popularly known as TESDA. The program has developed a robust curriculum on STEM skills and core skills, leading to a national qualification. This program offers scholarship to encourage participation and also internship opportunities facilitating the transitions to employment. This is an example of successful program, but how can we take it to the next level? This is the real question, and I look forward to exchanging our views further. Thank you, Shrivinas. And then I'd like to move on to Jennifer from Microsoft, Jennifer Brooks. Hi, Jennifer. So we'd like to ask you a question. From your perspective, and you're a huge company and you're all over the world, what are the biggest challenges and opportunities in skilling more women in ICT jobs? And are there, you as well, some success stories you could point us to as best practices in this area? Well, thank you, Shia. And uh, first of all, thank you for having us um, join the STI Forum. Thank you to the IOE and to the ILO for this opportunity. I work specifically in our Microsoft Philanthropies team, look at our global partnerships. And Microsoft's mission statement is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. This includes, of course, communities around the world that are the hardest to reach as people in LDC countries, and especially women. First of all, I would start by saying that the women gap and the women gap in ICT jobs is not something that we can do alone. And we've heard from you and women specifically, right? What is the, the data gap? And we have to make all informed decisions that are based on data. Um, this, again, is an aspiration that I think we, we could include right as part of, of our discussions here. How do we really um, are able to tackle solutions together that, that are based on data points? Having said this, um, at Microsoft, first and foremost, all of our skills for jobs and livelihoods program target at least uh, 50% of women. We strictly look at that gender parity in all of our social res responsibility impact programs and investments. And we provide support to those who have been excluded from opportunities, especially women, through our ecosystem of nonprofits, international organizations, government and industry partners. So we look at the resources that we design on, on skilling to really meet people where they are in this killing a journey. And as Nicholas was, was also referring to how those opportunities and technology really will look at offering all of the skills resources for free and the certifications that Microsoft offers through our Skills for Jobs program are based on that market analysis on where the demand is coming from. And the, this skill learning pathways are geared towards that demand. And one example that is also very important, um, thinking of the women integration into this digital economy is cybersecurity. Cybersecurity threats have grown exponentially across uh, the last two years, and organizations are simply not equipped to deal with this um, new and complex threat. Um, there's not enough people with cybersecurity skills and expertise to protect public and private infrastructure. And it's not just uh, because a lack of not trying to hire people, it's because um, there's really a gap on cybersecurity skills. There will be by 2025, at least 3.5 million cybersecurity jobs open globally, which is, this is a huge percentage increase since 2014, for example. But cybersecurity is a global problem. 
right, that it requires solution across our society, across our organizations, to make investments really to protect this digital world from threat of cyber attacks. Um, we have a partnership with OECD. We work with many um, organizations in this matter. But important and relevant for our discussion today is please remember this number, but only 17% of the cybersecurity workforce are women. 17% only are women, sorry to repeat it, but I want to leave you with this idea that excluding women and leaving women out of the cybersecurity workforce will only hurt further our ability to close the skill gap. I can also talk about the gap of women in computer science. I could also talk about you know, other problems on basic digital literacy skills that are lacking in that you know, pipeline of women entering the digital workforce. But this isn't just about equality. This is a business case too. We sh there's study after study where we know, ILO knows this very well, IOE as well, that gender diverse businesses perform much better. And diversity is crucial for the cybersecurity workforce. Um, we personally, uh, personally, I mean, the company Microsoft has recently launched an international campaign to help skill 250,000 individuals, like we do, for example, in India with a partnership with Cyber Skisha um, to help young female engineer graduate uh, on cybersecurity. But this is something um, that we all need to tackle together in the DNA of all of our programs, cyber or any digital skills program has to have a gender parity DNA embedded into this. And again, I call into that data gap that we have on, um, on women to be something we also address together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So we are talking about the issues and the problems, but there's an opportunity here, a huge opportunity that we need to make sure that we uh, address, particularly in attracting our young people and young girls. Um, so now we'll move on to our employer federation from Dibuti Hasna. And um, it would be great, I'm going to ask you a question because you heard a little bit from your different employers federations throughout the world. The um, employers federations, which for people who don't know are business associations at the country level that really represent the views of large and small companies. So we know that the backbone of most economies are actually SMEs and not large companies. So should we approach the training needs of SMEs differently from multinationals or national large companies? And what are some of the key elements that make a program successful in the training um, area from an employer's perspective? You have the floor, Hasna. Thank you very much, Shia. Can you hear me well? Yes, we hear you well. Thank you. Thank you so much for your question and for having me also. Uh, as you know, in, in multinational companies, uh, training is centralized. There is a department or service dedicated to to training in ICT and, uh, and even uh, gender issues. Uh, so there are competent uh, human resources uh, with an IT team, with a manager, who is in charge of uh, uh, ident identifying the training needs. And the budget also is available for uh, to implement a digitalization uh, project, including uh, tackling the uh, gender disparities, which is not the case always in SMEs because uh, digitalization is not consider considered uh, as a priority uh, because of the size of the company, of the budget. So, and even when it is uh, considered as a priority, training may not be considered as a, a priority. The, 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 the employees are led with the software and they have to deal with, with it and to uh, not to be trained. So, uh, even if the content should be the same, the approach should be different uh, with how we uh, treat the training for SMEs and multinational companies. Uh, because of the lack of awareness, the lack of technical and uh, financial resources, 
uh, we should put uh, more focus on this for to help uh, SMEs, especially in LDCs. And what would be the key elements uh, that make a program su successful uh, from an employer's uh, point of view? First, uh, the training uh, priorities has to be defined, uh, has to be, and, and the needs has to be well defined because. According to the uh, nature of the business, whether it's logistics, financial services, which areas should be uh, tackled? Uh, human resource management or payment processes? So, and what type of, what type of training? So it is very necessary to, uh, uh, to set up either upgrading or retraining programs or uh, uh, to develop specialized skills. So, uh, Defining the training priorities is very important. Second, I would say that the quality, the, efficient, the efficiency and the security of the digital tools are very important because in LDC, sometimes we use uh, copies or secondhand uh, tools and software materials. So, uh, and then it's more expensive and not safe. So, and uh, Jennifer talked about the cyber security threat. So this uh, has, we have, the companies has to be very cautious with, with, with this uh, quality and efficiency of, of the tools. Uh, and the third, I would say that the program uh, approach, the program's approach needs, need to be cost effective. SMEs has to be convinced of the added value uh, brought by the digitalization so that can, they can invest in it. If they're not convinced, they, they wouldn't go for it. So I think that uh, there is an awareness raising uh, approach that need to be done towards uh, the SMEs. So I would, I would stop for this question uh, here. This is great. The conversation is so fascinating and you're, we're, we're looking at it from the three different perspectives, but at the same time, there's a lot of, uh, common ground here. So I'll come back to you, uh, Srinivas, um, with another question. Could you list just three interventions from a policy perspective, because obviously ILO is very much about policies that could improve and increase the skills um, of the workforce? And, and what do you see as some of the impact of these interventions from a policy perspective? Thank you very much, Sia. Uh, there are many important policy areas uh, for interventions, but I would like to highlight three of them. Uh, firstly, uh, the aspect of lifelong learning policies. One job for life is no longer valid for many occupations, as we realize. People have to undertake multiple transitions during their life course. So given that importance of multiple transitions and the increasing needs of reskilling and upskilling, Building a robust national lifelong learning system is very important. One of the well-known front runners of this lifelong learning system, for example, is Singapore. A key element of their system is the skills future credit. This individual learning account provides learning credits to all citizens, about 25 year olds in the country, every year to undertake reskilling and upskilling based on their interest and, and also the market need. Since the launch of this program, the credit uh, has contributed to increase in the adult learning participation. A second example of a policy intervention is digitalization of skill systems. The case of Senegal, very important area is the digitalization, in particular, the promotion of online and blended learning and dynamic skills assessment and certification systems. This is key to achieve scale in my view and obtain value for money doing more with the same or less level of resources. In Senegal, a new national strategy for TVET digitalization, TVET is the technical and vocational education and training, was uh, established. Based on this, a massive online open course was developed. This program focuses on digital and entrepreneurship skills for women and young girls. Online program offers flexibility to reconcile the demands of family life with the time needed for the skills training. And the third example is from Costa Rica on apprenticeships. The promotion of apprenticeships and work-based learning uh, is also a very important area. ILO, along with the Global Apprenticeship Network, the GAN, engage with businesses to help them understand the importance of apprenticeships, but also mobilize other actors. 
Costa Rica, for example, more and more companies are now implementing new apprenticeship programs thanks to this advocacy work, particularly championed by the GAN. So the country also modernizes their apprenticeship programs through the use of new technology and online learning options. These are some of the important uh, interventions. We, uh, from the ILO, uh, across these interventions, the involvement of businesses is critical in order to reduce the mismatch between skills actually supplied by the education industry or the training industry and the skills required for the labor market. This is, these are some of the very classic interventions at the policy level. Uh, thank you, Shia. Well, thank you so much. That's such a rich, diverse sort of group of um, examples. And what's very clear is you don't do it alone. Public-private partnerships, linking all these organizations together, including employers is critical. So Jennifer, we're going to come back to you and uh, just ask you another question. Given your role at Microsoft in partnerships and leading this work, what have, do you have any examples of really I'm sure you do, of positive and impactful partnerships, in particularly in the skills area. And what are the key elements that you think made that successful or made them successful, shall I say? Thank you, Shia. So we are very clear that now and in the future, but the future is here already and the digital economy is here, more jobs will require digital skills. And these are not just tech enabled jobs, but they're also tech jobs, right? Where the opportunities um, are available for people to enter a digital economy. These um, situation is yet that people from excluded communities are consistently underrepresented in technology. COVID, economic recession, the humanitarian crisis, you know, people that are displaced and digital transformation have deepened this digital divide. And the negative impact existed before and isn't going away anytime soon. So our work is focused on closing that skills gap by ensuring that everyone from young people to adults in the workforce have the chance to gain those skills to access digital opportunities. And every person needs access to these skills. Um, and it's the only way we're providing opportunities for them to succeed in a changing economy. As, as Renivers was saying, um, the future of work is transforming all the time. So that lifelong learning policy continues to be really fundamental for all of us to adapt and continue to grow, to be able to participate in these economies. But the scaling challenge not only impacts individuals, but it also, impacts companies and industries and communities that need that diverse talents in the workforce. So within Microsoft Philanthropies, digital equity is one of the core pillars of our work. And the Skills for Jobs and Livelihoods team where I work on global partnership addresses the skills gaps through creating pathways and learning pathways to careers in partnership with over 200 global nonprofits and international organizations. And we provide access to our skills content and certifications, ensuring that we not only train, but we certify, we provide learner support in that journey and employability guidance and access to these resources to learn these skills is inequitable. We need to take action collectively to make sure we're not leaving most of the world population behind. And because this is not something we can do alone, this is where we come together um, with stakeholders like all of you here in, in this forum, but also governments and other private sector areas to mobilize these resources. There are some examples, I, I, I can't cover all of our commitments here, but I, there are some examples I do want to highlight. Uh, we participate with the ITU and the Partners to Connect initiative. We have pledged to train and certify 10 million people from underserved communities, especially women, with in-demand digital foundation and technical skills by 2025. And we are on our way to reach that goal because we know, and as you asked Chia, what are some good examples is that we know that learners have to be supported 
by the local community based on profits to have a better chance to completing those learning pathways. There has to be um, a midway between totally hybrid and 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 hand holding when we want to see success in that placement into jobs earning a certificate or a credential is really a, a big step into that journey and ultimately to improve their livelihoods we're also very excited that we just launched a pilot program with the ioe called tech at work to work with local partners specifically in two ldcs lesotho and senegal and hoping to expand this program to Uganda and DRC to, uh, in each country, train a maximum of 5,000 people with basic demand-driven digital skills, soft employability, and entrepreneurship. With ILO and, um, and Srinivas and, and the team at ILO um, really have been instrumental through a partnership where we have committed to decent jobs for youth, but most importantly, we are focused on supporting those who have been excluded from opportunity because of race, gender, geography, displacement, and other barriers. And we are bringing together resources to meet people where they are on their scaling journey. We have a common vision with the ILO to enable digital equity and foster opportunities aligned to the policy um, uh, conversation we were having with Srinivas on lifelong learning, decent and gender responding, um, responsive job creation for youth, micro-entrepreneurship opportunities for women and displaced people, and of course, host communities in the digital economy. So okay. these are just a few examples of partnerships where we are excited to work together to um, build a diverse and inclusive workforce. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Jennifer. So many initiatives by your by your by Microsoft. It's amazing. Um, so very quickly, Hasna, I know we want to also get around to a series of questions, um, but I'm going to take ask you, Hasna, um, one last question. Coming from an LDC, there are many additional challenges from access to electricity, getting computers, and just having basic education. What are three items that need to be addressed in order to make progress on the challenges, particularly in LDCs? Thank you, Shia. Uh, I think the first thing should be uh, to popularize uh, digital technology at all levels, uh, beginning by uh, basic education programs for girls and boys, uh, and, and further to discover, uh, to help, uh, help them discover digital uh, jobs and also encourage the emergence of civil society groups around the digital economy and uh, society. Second, if we focus on the professional world, we uh, have to invest in digital training and improve employability. Uh, carry out uh, pr prospective studies of digital skill needs uh, in the in the current in LDCs, uh, how many uh, employees in uh, ITCs do we need? In which uh, which specialties? Uh, because of the uh, we have to also tackle the, the mismatch of, of skills. Uh, the public and private sector uh, also uh, should engage in an ongoing digital training programs. EBMOs can uh, and should play a catalytic role catalytic role by harmonizing the use of digital tools, uh, by offering training services for sectorial activities, uh, which will lead uh, also to reduce costs uh, of these tools. So if they, they organize and they help their members to uh, organize by sector, then of course they can reduce the, the cost of, of the uh, uh, tools. They, uh, they sh we, we should also bring uh, multinational companies in the digital field to accompany both the private and pu public sector. So uh, lastly, I will say that uh, we have to deploy a high co quality connectivity infrastructure and more competitively uh, priced services. And this is the uh, problem for LDCs. 
uh, we have to improve. Uh, uh, of course, the government has to, 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 to do its part, but the private sector has also to, uh, to, to give a hand, uh, improve internet quality, extend connectivity, uh, including rural areas and where girls are more likely to, to be a victim of digital scarcity and lower internet and energy uh, prices. Okay, well, thank you so much. And such a rich dialogue. But now I mm. want to give you a few minutes, the three of you, to sort of ask questions to your colleagues. So maybe um, I'll start with Srinivas. Sorry, I'm showing the same order. But do you want to ask one of your colleagues a question? Thank you, Shia. Yes, um, it would be a pleasure to ask a question to Hasna, who is a um, champion of gender equality. And, and I have a question for you, uh, Hasna. Uh, gender equal, equality should be at the heart of uh, our efforts to ensure inclusive and uh, digital transformation. Um, based on your observation, what are some of the major barriers to bridging the gender digital divide? And what roles do you believe employers and business member organizations can play to bridge the digital divide? Thank you, Hasna, for taking the question. Thank you, thank you. I will I will be build on what uh, Jennifer has already said about uh, uh, the gender digital uh, gap. Uh, overall, women have less access to mobile phones, for instance, and gender inequalities relate to the lowest skill levels, the use of application on a mobile phone, as well as more advanced uh, skills such as coding. So the main causes are related to uh, difficulties such as so access to tools, financial constraints, uh, digital skills, interest in ICT also, and online safety and uh, stereotypes. So um, awareness should be raised before the before the world of work to encourage the feminization of digital profession uh, awareness raising action should be carried out for young girls in school uh, but also for their families for the teachers uh, education advisor and more generally the entire educational eco ecosystem this is very crucial and uh, ebmios could also intervene at this level uh, by partnering with the public se sector so they can also boost women professionalization in these areas and share best practices by first organizing uh, digitalization training for women, part of the uh, company staff, uh, put up a team within the organization uh, specialized in new technology and innovation who will conduct TOT sessions, uh, give incentives, such as prices or distinction to innovation gender uh, sensitive uh, enterprise, and also fa uh, facilitate participation to regional and in all international fairs for women and mentorship programs. The, I think that this should uh, open the eyes of women. I, I mean, especially in LDCs, because this is an issue. The interest from the basic uh, education stage has to be uh, uh, raised. And I, I would give just an example of uh, Somali in Somaliland, uh, Telesom, which is the company of uh, telecommunication, they offer simplified account to enable women with I, with, without ID to access uh, mobile, mobile money services. They just ask for the name, a photo, and, uh, and, and the date of birth. They don't ask for the IDs because we know that in LDCs, IDs are not always a simple uh, document to get. And in Kenya, just uh, uh, to, 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 to finish, uh, Safaricom has partnered with, uh, with Google, I'm sorry for <laughs> Jennifer, uh, to offer the most affordable smartphone in the country because of the lack of uh, financial resources. So companies and uh, business uh, organization can uh, help and partner with the, with the government to, to, to act on these issues. Great, thank you so much. And now I'm going to move to Jennifer. Jennifer, do you have a question for one of your colleagues? Thank you, Shia. Yes, I wanna follow up please with um, Srinivas with um, your policy recommendations. I think um, 
when you look at real transformational impact, um, where ILO brings together the government, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, really you have mentioned the three most important for you policy um, opportunities. But there's one we're really keen on understanding better, which is skills-based hiring as a policy opportunity to enable further livelihoods. What, what are your thoughts on skills-based hiring policies? Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, for this great question. Um, in fact, uh, for a real transformational social impact, I think we need to dream big and aspire for a real breakthrough, big breakthrough. Uh, we at the ILO see a huge need and opportunity for innovative and strategic partnerships to promote universal access to skills using digital technologies and blended programs to achieve the scale and promote equity and skills-based hiring. Let, let me propose, can we dream to make the blended programs, digital tools and equipment accessible and available to every person in every part of the world to pursue skills acquisition whenever and wherever they want at their will and pleasure, truly reflecting the aspirations and interests and needs of the markets. And why I say this, this is one of the big learnings from the COVID that the skills acquisition through digital platforms and digital tools has become so you know, universal that you know, people in all parts of the world have been able to access, but not all people. So you know, that is the gap. So businesses like uh, Microsoft, uh, Jennifer, you are doing great work to promote the skills acquisition, your partnerships with us in the ILO through the decent jobs for youth and also the digital skills programs and then your ambition to train millions of people and certify them and the partnerships that you have just signed, for example, with uh, uh, IOE, and the tech at work. These are some of the excellent examples of this important collaboration. I feel more, business join, more businesses need to join forces with IOE and ILO and other agencies that would make possible to reach all parts of the world and reach scale to take it, take it to the next level. In particular, we see a huge vacuum in the public policy on the issue of assessment and certification of systems. In order to really support bite-sized learning in an integrated system, there is a need for dynamic assessment and recognition systems, including the use of micro-credentials. Then the skills-based hiring can actually benefit everyone without leaving anyone behind and address the triple mismatch, the jobs, skills, and aspirations. So this is an area we are very excited and looking for you know, strategic collaborations, further deepened collaborations with uh, uh, you know, businesses and, uh, and, and relevant organizations. Uh, and, and we are uh, very, very uh, excited to look forward to discussing new ideas and new partnerships. Thank you, Jennifer. Great. Okay, so Hasna, the last person, do you have a question for one of your colleagues? Oh. We hear you, Hasna. Yeah. Uh, th thank you very much, Shia. Uh, of course, I will. I will stick on gender issues, and I, I, I want to ask uh, Jennifer uh, a question. Uh, uh, as you know, Jennifer, in the least developed countries, socioeconomic barriers uh, often, if not always, uh, underlie the digital divide and innovation gap. This problem is even more acute for girls and young women in some disadvantaged uh, neighborhoods and region. Can you share, I know you have, you have already shared some examples, but can you share some good practices that Microsoft has experienced elsewhere, uh, especially in Africa, which have aimed to encourage uh, female entrepreneurship while building uh, the digital capacity? Do you think that your, comp your company could help the, uh, our uh, organization in Djibouti, which has not benefited from uh, much of all these programs that I am hearing? And uh, our member organization is uh, currently chaired by women. So maybe it, it would be a win-win uh, relationship to launch pilot projects combining female entre entrepreneurship, promotion, and digital technology. Sorry for the long question. Thank you, Hasna. And I know, Shia, we're over the hours, so I'll be super brief with this. Hasna, first of all, 
gender parity is my passion as well. So I welcome the opportunity to continue the conversation with you. Definitely we'll put at your disposal all of our skills, resources, and certifications for um you. for your for your you know communities of interest and your organization. Happy to do that. Let's continue that conversation. And humbly, really, really humbly, we are committed with gender parity and this doesn't mean um, it is enough, right? So I want to leave uh, Shia with that sense of urgency on really having inclusive, you know, behaviors in all of the programs that we build. We work with UNHCR in the humanitarian development space, ensuring that girls and women participate uh, in a program we have, for example, in Kakuma, Kenya, where women have become, after 17 years in camp, uh, also trainers on digital skills, for example. We work with NRC in Kenya, Uganda, Jordan, and Ethiopia to make sure we always reach um, women that have micro businesses with their skills they need. Uh, we also work with Generation and Simplon on advanced tech skills to ensure women are represented and are 50% of participation in the programs, even when they're data analysts or data engineers or really AI champions. But this is not enough. And we know that and we are um, eager to learn further from organizations like, like yours, Hasna, and our partnership with IOE and Srinivas and ILO um, to make this real for many women that are excluded from the digital economy. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, this has been such a rich conversation. Um, Srinivas, Jennifer, Hasna, uh, really, really wonderful. So we say we have the digital divide and we need to address that. And then once we look at getting the computers and getting the access, we need the skills. But once we get the skills, we wanna make sure those young people and older workers who are reskilled have jobs. And we want to make sure that when they get those jobs, they work in climate friendly jobs, which basically these people who are trained are going to help us to really actually reach the SDGs and make sure that no one is left behind. So all of your great work, the three of you coming to the three different perspectives is amazing. And it really proves that we might be able to, and I know we're far behind on the SDGs, particularly SDG four and five, but hopefully with us working together, we'll be able to have, we still have eight years left to meet our targets. So again, I would love to thank you again. I'm sorry I didn't in the beginning, Microsoft, ILO for co-sponsoring this event. And we look forward to having other events with you. And we really want to say good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Thank you so much.